Carroll. I am the Connect Groups Pastor here at Weston Fist First Assembly, and I would love to welcome you to part three of our Connect Groups Leadership Training. Today, we're going to be focusing on chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12 of our book, Leading Small Groups by Chris Surratt. Let's kick off with chapter 9, Practicing Genuine Authenticity. As leaders, we want to understand that there is a near-paralyzing fear that comes with true authenticity. We can often think things like, if people only knew the things that I've done in the past, if people only knew my shortcomings, if people only knew my failures, my private thoughts, if people only knew my sin that's based on my insecurities, I'm sure we've all been there. So as we lead our groups, we want to keep this in mind, that our members may be facing these exact same thoughts. With this in mind, we want to create a safe place. Perfection is not expected. We want to show what it looks like to walk in confession, to walk in honesty, and to walk in accountability with one another. Contrary to what it may feel like, we don't have to be afraid of confessing our sin. Not because we don't sin, or because our sin doesn't have consequences, but because through the gospel we know that we are forgiven of our sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The gospel enables us to be transparent and it compels us toward a greater end that lies beyond transparency. There is opportunity for healing to take place whenever we're honest and vulnerable with one another. So how can you, as the leader, create a space for genuine authenticity? Well, we want to encourage you to model it and practice it from the very beginning. And here's some ways that you can do that. Be willing to lead the way. Model vulnerability when the time is right to help create a culture of confession and sharing with one another. Be prepared before the group meeting. Prepare for the potential things that could happen, for the potential questions to your answers that you're going to ask, or even other potential questions that may could come up. Ease into the personal questions. Give time for relationship building to take place first. Going too personal too fast can be a deterrent for some people. Keep the focus on Jesus and His grace. Point everything back to Him. His goodness, His grace, His forgiveness, His redemptive power, His sacrifice, His mercy. Point everything back to Jesus. And lastly, make prayer an integral part of your group. Thank God for who He is. Focus on what He has shown you through the study. Ask God to help your group live out His Word and lift up the individual needs of the group. As scary as it can be sometimes, we want our group members to get to a place where they can be vulnerable with their connect groups. And so getting to this place of showing genuine authenticity, it starts with you as the leader. And so we want to encourage you to practice these things from the very beginning, from the very first meeting, and to consistently show genuine authenticity as you lead your group. Chapter 10 talks about developing honoring service. And when we look at the word service and what it means to serve, we know that we serve because Christ has already served us. Serving starts with the good news that Jesus saw us, He served us, and He sacrificed Himself for us. And once we first comprehend that we ourselves are broken and needy, we can truly begin to serve the broken and needy that's around us. Here are five steps to helping your group live out gospel-centered service. Serve your group first. Empower group members to serve the group. Serve together in the church. Serve together in the community. And serve together in the world. I would love to direct you to pages 111 through 115 of our book for specific examples for how to serve in each of these ways. Chris Surratt said something in chapter 10 that really hit home with me, so I want to share it here with you. And this is what he says. I've had to become comfortable with not everything being done the way I would do it, and not being afraid to challenge group members to take ownership. I have learned that most people will not know how to help until you give them a way to help. And this was something that was super powerful and stood out to me because I'm somebody who loves to be in control. I love to know how things are gonna happen, when they're gonna happen, and be in control of all the details. But when it comes to service, a lot of people don't know how to help or how to serve unless we present them with an opportunity to do so. 
So with this in mind, we would love to encourage you to give your group members opportunities to serve and make service a part of the culture of your connect group. When it comes to your group collectively whole group going out to serve, an idea that I would love to share with you is to take either a piece of paper or you can write it down in your phone and open up the floor to your group about ways that you can serve. And you can make it specific. You can say, hey, what are some ways that we can serve in our church? Or what are some ways that we can serve in our community? And then open up the floor and let them share their awesome ideas with you. Then as a group, pick one. Pick one or two ways that you can serve and then go out and do it together. That's a great way for your group members to have that ownership, to have the ownership and the decision and the ownership and the service opportunity. Chapter 11 talks about being on mission. And when I think about being on mission, I also think about keeping the end in mind from the beginning, or in other words, thinking about the end goals and everything that we do should be pointing towards those goals, helping us reach those goals. And two goals that we have for our connect groups here at WMFA are deepening of relationships and discipleship. So we want everything that we do with our connect groups to point back to these two goals to make sure that we are remaining on mission. Every small group needs a reason for existence. While community is a very important piece of our connect groups, it is not the destination. It is not the end goal of our groups. A small group that gathers strictly around the desire to make friends will live or die on the strength of those relationships. We together are meant to help each other follow Jesus more closely. And in doing so, this will extend the gospel into all the world. This is our mission. This is the Great Commission. This is the redeemed version of community. It's relationships that are centered on seeing the mission of God come to pass first in our own hearts and then eventually into the world. As you align your group around the gospel-centered mission of Jesus, remember that we had to hear the good news before we could share the good news. We had to be brought to life by the message before we could be its messengers. So here are some ways for how to help your group be on mission from the beginning. Set the expectation early that the group is open to new people who might need what the group can offer. Include studies that help the group understand the mission of Jesus. Take part in at least one missional activity every semester and end each group meeting by praying for opportunities to live out the gospel that week. Each of us has a mandate to be missionaries in our daily lives. Every person that we come across is an opportunity, an opportunity to follow Jesus in his mission to share the truth to a hurting and a dying world. Being on mission should result from biblical community. Jesus doesn't want us to gather so that we can remain gathered, so that we can remain within these four walls. Jesus wants us to be gathered so that we can be sent out, so that we can share the good news of Jesus Christ. Chapter 12 talks about developing a Bible study, or in our case, even selecting a Bible study. An essential tool of a gospel-centered small group is choosing a study that always points back to the centrality of the gospel of Jesus. An effective Bible study will always show Christ through the narrative of the text. As we lead a study, we should note Paul's pattern of teaching in the epistles, believe, become, behave. We are reminded of what we believe, that because of the gospel we believe, we have become something different. And as a result of the new creation we have become, our behavior begins to change. Whenever you're preparing for your Bible study, we want you to utilize tools that will help you feel more confident as a leader. Some examples include, but are not limited to, Bible Commentary, Bible Concordance, Bible Encyclopedia, Bible Dictionary, and online study tools. Use these to your advantage to help you prepare for your group so that you can have great meetings every time that your group comes together. If you have chosen to use Right Now Media for your studies, here are some tips that we would like to share with you. Watch the video ahead of time. Pre-test the tech. Allow the group to process the teaching. Study the Bible, not the teacher, and leave time after the video for discussion. Remember our two goals, deepening relationships and discipleship. So this end point here, leaving time after the video for discussion is going to be a huge key component 
allowing the floor to be open for the members in your group. We want your group members to feel like your time together is well organized, well thought of, and that you are well prepared. So using these tips to help you is highly encouraged. Also prioritize having a balanced plan. We want our group members to have a balanced spiritual diet, so to speak. Our goal should be to create mature disciples who then go out and make disciples. Ensure that the study will drive members towards spiritual maturity, help assure sound theology, and be practical for the whole group. Thank you so much for joining us. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or any of our staff pastors. We look forward to seeing you for part four of our Connect Group Leadership Training.